Thank you very much. I think it's uh, extremely difficult to predict the future, uh, especially in healthcare, because this is a rapidly evolving uh, field. So what I will try to do is to uh, give you some information on the things that are happening today and try to see how they may evolve in, uh, in the next uh, 40 years or so. So, of course, we all hope that all of these new developments will help us to uh, find solutions for the major challenges in, in healthcare in the world. And uh, it's, it's a bit uh, ironically that actually one of the major successes in healthcare in the past has been the, the, the uh, increase in, in the mean age of the population, and we heard about it also by the previous speaker. And this, in fact, will be one of the major challenges in the future, because we already heard that uh, in uh, 2050 we will have a, a, a huge population of people aged 80 and older. And as you know, uh, about one in four, one in three people of this uh, age develop Alzheimer's disease. So you will immediately see that Alzheimer's disease will be one of the main uh, problems, the main challenges in the world in the future, uh, uh, due to the uh, increased uh, age of the population. In a Western society, there are five diseases which appear to be very important in terms of uh, health, and these are cancer, diabetes, mental illness, or brain disease in general, heart disease, and respiratory illness. They account for uh, 36 million deaths per year at this moment. And uh, what we see is that some of these diseases are lifestyle related, and they all have one thing in common, and this is that they are chronic diseases. Uh, and we also believe that cancer will become more and more a chronic disease. So these are diseases that you keep until you die, and of course they require a lot of input also from the medical system to uh, define new uh, drugs for all of these uh, treatments. The situation is a little bit different if you live in developing countries, because in those countries still infectious diseases are uh, considered to be the major health uh, problems at this, uh, at this moment, and also childhood mortality and maternal health are important critical issues, and that's why also they have been formulated in the Millennium Goals of the World Health Organization. And in those countries where you see that development is increasing, you also see a rise of the chronic diseases which are most associated with the Western uh, style. So what I will try to do very shortly is, is to give you some examples of the things that are happening today and how they may help us to overcome some of these uh, health problems in the future. And I will focus on, on three or four topics, uh, and the first is what I call the genomic revolution. We have celebrated a couple of weeks ago the 16th anniversary of the landmark uh, paper in Nature by Watson and Crick, who described the structure of the DNA double helix. And in uh, 2003, about 10 years ago, scientists all over the world have been able to uh, make a first map of the human genome, bringing uh, a map of the, the full order of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the basis of our DNA, which was a huge effort because it uh, accounts for over 3 million uh, base pairs. And this information now is more and more used in, in medical practice. And of course you are aware of the genetic tests that, that are performed to uh, screen in, in uh, some of uh, the families where uh, inherited uh, diseases are, are being present. And usually those diseases have a more uh, rare uh, um, prevalence, so they are not always that important. But what we see today is that we are deciphering the genetic uh, importance and the genes that are responsible for diseases, just uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, and so on. And more and more we are identifying the genes that uh, make up your susceptibility to develop those diseases. And the question, of course, is what will you do if, uh, uh, if you are diagnosed with a gene that is increasing your susceptibility to vascular diseases? Of course, you can change your lifestyle, your diet, and things like that. And actually the world really this, the understood what was happening today in the case of Angelina Jolie, of, of, uh, everyone knows that she is uh, in a family with a, a, a gene that is uh, predisposing to uh, cancer, breast cancer in this case. It increases her risk of developing this cancer, but this risk is not 100%, and that's why she decided to remove her breast in order to prevent the development of breast cancer. Another example of what is happening today is actually the case of uh, this boy, Nick uh, Volker. He's, I think he's about 10 years old today. And he was actually the first uh, guy or the first boy that uh, his life was saved thanks to the sequencing of his full genome. Today we have the capacity to sequence your whole genome for individuals. And uh, in Nick Volker this, uh, this has happened. He was born with a traumatic disease, a uh, fatal disease, in which uh, he could not take up any food and, uh, and there were really holes that came into his uh, intestines and doctors did not know what was happening. This was a disease that they did not see before. So they decided that that's uh, time to sequence his full genome. 
And by doing that, uh, they found that he had a mutation in a gene that was important for his immune system. And uh, in this way, they could see that uh, it, with a bone marrow transplantation, uh, uh, his immune system could be healed. And this was what has happened. And as you can see, the boy now, it's two years ago, is uh, eating together with his uh, school friends. And this uh, really, I think, is, is what will happen also in the future, that we will see that the sequencing technology will be, become very important. In this uh, figure, you can see that the cost of uh, sequencing uh, genomes has uh, fallen down dramatically. In, in 2000, it costed about $3 million to sequence your genome. Today, we're speaking about $1,000, about and we will soon probably go beneath this, uh, this figure. And this is really, really, really uh, interesting, because uh, I know that people from the engineering department, they are always impressed by Moore's law. And if, you, if you see the difference here with Moore's law, because it's a logarithmic scale, uh, then you see what's happening. You see also the number of genomes that are sequenced today. And in a couple of years, we will all have our genome uh, sequenced. And this can lead us to funny things. We can probably load it on our uh, mobile phone and put on our uh, uh, Bluetooth and then see who, who is a relative, maybe here in this audience, or you can check uh, the, the difference of your genome with uh, famous people. But I believe that this will also uh, have a lot of applications in the medical field where we will see that based on this genomic profile, uh, patients will be treated uh, with drugs that are more tailored uh, to individual patients. And this is already happening in the case of cancer, where uh, people are, or uh, tumors are now screened for the genetic signature, and based on that genetic signature, uh, uh, treatments are uh, optimized for a given patient, because we know that, for instance, in cancer, some of the drugs that are used only uh, are effective in, let's say, 50 or 60 percent of all patients. So by doing this, you can tailor those therapies more to individual patients, and this is called the, the area of the, the uh, personalized medicine. A second example that I want to give you is the uh, the digital health explosion that we will see also in medicine. I think already today a lot of uh, health data are stored somewhere in the office of your doctor and they will be more and more stored now in, in the digital information systems and this goes to of course all your blood tests, all your diseases that you have before, the drugs that you have taken, vaccinations that you have undergone or maybe allergies that you are experiencing and all of these data will more and more be uh, grouped and, and probably will be put on your electronic ID card in the future and this will help you of course if you travel in your country or in the world that also if you have to consult a doctor let's say in China that he will know what kind of allergies you have and of course this is important also for your therapies. But what we'll see in, in the next couple of years is that this type of information will grow with uh, new devices, new sensors that will be uh, sometimes uh, implanted in individuals, sometimes uh, brought into your smart clothing, and these sensors will be used to monitor some of your health uh, uh, information status, uh, for instance your cardiac function, uh, temperature, whatever, they can all be monitored, you can even print chips even on the skin, and this uh, of course will lead to a, a new way of uh, looking at patients. Today most of the uh, patients are seen when they go to the doctor. In this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, approach, of course, many health functions will be monitored uh, during your activities. And um, we're also doing quite a lot of research in this field, and we have a mobile health unit here at the University of Hasselt, and we're uh, following up uh, 500 uh, patients with cardiovascular diseases with uh, invasive and also non-invasive uh, non technologies. A third application I think that will be extremely important is uh, repairing uh, human body parts with uh, 3D printing and uh, cellular therapy, stem cell therapy. Um, these are two young girls um, who probably would not be alive today if they would not be helped with 3D printing and cell therapy. This is a very recent story, Kaiba, uh, it was in the news I think a couple of days ago. She was born with a problem in the windpipe in the trachea and uh, the, she always had a collapse of this uh, trachea, and therefore she had difficulties in breathing. This girl, Hana, in Korea, was born even without a uh, trachea, so she had really difficulties, of course, in breathing, and doctors had positioned a plastic tube, uh, but this was only a solution for a short while. So these children would have died if nothing would have happened. And uh, this girl has now been treated with a 3D printed um, a tubing that was positioned around her trachea and uh, prevented that from uh, collapsing and it appears that she's doing well. Hana has been treated on April 30, so very, very recently, uh, with a new 3D printed um, tube and as you can see here she's doing uh, pretty well. 
Um, this technology is becoming available for these type of applications and it combines 3D printing also with cellular uh, approaches. Uh, in our own department, uh, my colleagues Ivo Lambrex and Jules Balkans have uh, hit the World Press last year when they uh, prepared a human uh, jaw, a 3D printed human jaw for a, a patient and uh, later on also teeth were uh, implanted on this device. So, and other colleagues of our group, we have sometimes to tell you a little bit also what's happening here, have uh, worked on the development of a new type of uh, stem cell therapy approach for cardiovascular disease. So I think these two technologies will combine and will make it possible that in the future will we replace damaged uh, organs. One of the questions, of course, is will we, will we be able to replace all damaged uh, organs? And many people are thinking what will happen with the, with the brains. I think that will be extremely difficult. But on the other hand, what we see today is that communication systems are being explored in which uh, brain cells are communicated, for instance, with transistors. And uh, these type of technologies will also uh, open up possibilities and are doing that already now for people with uh, hearing deficits. <coughs> and uh, just one month ago, I think, at the uh, Science Museum in London, Rex, uh, the bionic man, was uh, presented, and I uh, to make sure he's on the left side here. <laughs> and, uh, he was equipped with all uh, human body parts that can be produced now artificially. For instance, a, a spleen, a blood that was made artificially, and also all the things that I already uh, spoke to you about. So this is really uh, going fast, and of course, this will also make possibilities in the future. A fourth uh, and final uh, um, new uh, thinking that, that we will see in the next years is that patients will look different to their disease and also to their doctor. I think this will no longer be uh, uh, existing in, in the next years. And just give me one, let me give you one example of what is happening here. Um, this is a website called Patients Like Me. It was developed by this young man, Stephen Kibbutz, uh, who was diagnosed with uh, ALS, which is a fatal disease. Um, and um, he uh, and his friends, and these were, uh, I think one of them was his brother and the other was his friend, they were all engineers at MIT. And um, when they searched the internet for more information about the ALS, also to find new information on um, experimental uh, therapies, uh, they were really frustrated to see that there was no valuable information on the internet. So they created a kind of Facebook for patients and opened this only for patients with a particular disease, ha having a particular drug or with particular symptoms. And as you can see already, this is uh, growing uh, uh, massively. And after some time, the uh, drug development companies decided, well, this is, this is great, this is huge information for us, sometimes we have to work on this for years to have the same information that is present here on this website. And now what you see is that the world is changing because these patients who have grouped themselves in patients like me are actually approaching drug companies to work with them and uh, develop drugs for diseases in which some of these companies may not be interested. So they say, okay, we give you that information, but you will help us to work on the drugs that we need for some uh, specific diseases. And if you go to the website, you can see that I have collaborations with all of the drug development companies at this moment. And also what you see today already is that uh, new companies are becoming interested in healthcare. Uh, very recently, the uh, British Cancer uh, Charity has teamed up with uh, companies, and you can read the names, of course, which are very familiar with you, uh, to bring all that technology also in the healthcare field. And this is already very new, of course, but these companies are also um, have a lot of technology to follow uh, uh, trades, to follow, uh, to monitor different, um, different uh, possibilities. And I think, of course, this will also lead to new possibilities for the future. And then, of course, the question is, how will this, all these developments uh, change the healthcare system in the future? And um, uh, I don't have time to, to go in depth, but uh, some people will ask, do we still need doctors in 2053? And the answer, of course, is yes, but um, just to make sure, I'm not sure the doctors in the audience, but uh, maybe you, should, you know the story of IBM Watson, that was a computer developed by IBM, and um, I think it... Uh, uh, it could win the, the Jeopardy TV show in, in the US, showing that it has a lot of capacity. And uh, very recently, maybe you can read with me, in, in three, two years ago, they have been able to fill this computer system with all the knowledge of a second year medical student. And today, they have a collaboration with uh, a major hospital in the US and are trying to bring all the information on oncology in this computer system. And you can read here, it's about 1.5 1 1 million patient records and so on. Um, and it's, it's important because it, there have been some studies showing that doctors only use 20%, 20% of the knowledge that they use to treat you is coming from trial-based evidence. 
So it's important that they bring all this knowledge. And they did one of the first tests, and I'm not sure if you have to believe that because it's not published yet, but they say this computer was successful in diagnosing lung cancer in 90% of all cases, while a human doctor uh, does that in 50% of cases. So clearly this technology will help uh, also in decision making in, in medical practice in, in the future. And especially in Japan, you see also that they're building now robots uh, to replace nurses or to replace some of the functions of nurses. And this uh, uh, left-hand side robot is helping patients to go from the bed to wheelchair and, and things like that. On the right-hand side, I must admit that I have been looking to this picture for quite some time to see whether it's a robot or a human face, but it appears to be a robot that can also talk to patients. Uh, nevertheless, without um, these are interesting products, interesting gadgets sometimes, but I think also in the future we know from many, many studies that social interaction, of course, is extremely important in care and will remain important in care. So as a conclusion, I, I would uh, like to give you a journey into the future and uh, maybe think about uh, Tom, uh, who is a boy that is born in uh, May 28, 2053, here in Diepenbeek, and uh, probably he is uh, born after a uh, IVF and embryo selection because his family already had three girls and they really want to have a boy now. And this uh, may, for instance, be take place in the Walking Egg Foundation, which is one of the IVF centers here in, in this region. And uh, usually at day three today, people take a little blood sample from the children to find out if they have some in, uh, major inherited uh, diseases. But probably at that time, they will use uh, a sample to do a genome sequence, uh, a genome scanning. And maybe uh, some of the companies like Seheka, which is a company also here in the region, may help to develop software to bring all this knowledge in their electronic health uh, record. And maybe that scan has shown that uh, Tom has an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. This disease, of course, will only develop later on in life. So at the age 15, uh, researchers from our own spin-off company, Mobile Health, you hustled Incorporated, will uh, um, uh, implant uh, some body sensors to monitor some of the uh, biomarkers which will help us to define when his uh, condition might become critical. And this appears to be the case at 45 years, where uh, to prevent a heart attack, he will receive a new uh, heart implanted at the Limburg Medical University Center. This is a joke, an internal joke here. And um, that is prepared by uh, Melot International, which is a company here in, in Zonova doing this type of thing, so, by the way. You don't spend much time uh, in, hos in hospitals at that moment, probably. I think uh, one or two days in hospital will be enough. And then you go to different areas. And for instance, here in, this, uh, in, 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 the, in the, uh, the region close to the most world, they have the plans to develop a Kinjoy Park, which is actually a touristic activity where patients will recover after surgery. So these are the things where you go after a surgery, uh, after a surgery and after some time, of course, you go home. But you still need drugs to uh, comply also with this new heart and let's hope that these drugs will then be delivered through uh, a small uh, uh, blasters that are developed or patches that are developed by Tebosov, again a company that is already present here on the campus. And then back home of course his health uh, status has to be monitored with all IT technologies and uh, again we have some interesting tools already at this moment with Kubiho for instance and also ASIC Healthcare Solutions can help to monitor and interact with his, uh, with his medical doctor. At age 93, Tom develops leukemia. And uh, this is important because uh, at that time, of course, we will have personalized treatments for cancer. So uh, based on the signature of his cancer type, a personalized treatment will be developed, maybe by Amaca, which is a drug development company here. And uh, these have to be brought to the patient uh, every day in a specialized way because they, the medication has to change every day. And then may, maybe Essence, which is a logistics uh, company, can help us with that. And then at age 110, a toe will die of an infection, and this is because most of the scientists have forgot that your immune system also gets old, and that uh, 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 coping with infections at old age will become a problem also in, in the future. So what I try to show you is that there is a lot of things happening, and some of these things uh, will be important for our health, but also for our economy, because some of these companies may grow uh, based on all these uh, new developments. And uh, with this, I, I uh, would like to uh, thank you for your attention, and you also see some further reading if you might be interested. Thank you.